Hey, everybody. <laughs> Guess what? It's first day of early voting in North Carolina. <laughs> and I went and voted this morning and no lines. I went to the Rexford place or whatever uh, area in South Park behind Coca-Cola Consolidated. And I was totally amazed, like no lines. So there you go. And one probably the first real brisk day that we felt of fall here in Charlotte, beautiful sunny day. And uh, Adam is all teed up and guess what? Um, Jack is doing lawyerly things with uh, some sort of a franchise association or something like that. Anybody interested in a franchise attorney or mergers and acquisitions, Jack Santanello's your guy, but he's not here today. So anyway, we're gonna be talking about EIDL loans and uh, financing and funding, uh, you know, options for people that have just been decimated in the mountains in particular, in multiple states. So um, Adam's going to go into that. And then he's, Adam is really good with numbers. That's why he's a CPA. <laughs> and that's why, and he, he, he really digs that. And so he's going to dig into some of the numbers, like what will be the financial impact, the likely financial impact of a Harris win or a Trump win. So we're going to try to keep this as apolitical as possible. <laughs> we all have opinions, but we're going to try to keep those opinions at bay and just try to deal with the facts, just the facts. So anyway, uh, oh, here we go. What do we got going on here from Joseph? uh i'm opening it up okay great thank you joseph just uh put in the chat a link where you can donate and they don't need any more food from what i'm hearing what they're needing are, are chainsaws and um oh this is to help Asheville businesses thank you joseph um but they are needing warm clothes they are needing space heaters they are needing sleeping bags and tents and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, make sure that you're actually providing them what they need. Um, you know, I've seen some funny things that uh, Jenny <laughs> Buchold from Haven Creative, she's working as kind of like a uh, an information officer or something like that up there in the mountains. And uh, she has posted some funny stuff that people have donated from really interesting lingerie <laughs> to like good grief. I mean, you know, yeah, money, <laughs> money and employees. So anyway, I'm going to take off the hat and uh, show my bald head and Adam, take us away. All right. Yeah. I, I tend to um, agree with what uh, Joseph just said there, and it's going to be aligned uh, with some of what we're going to talk about with respect to disaster relief, um, is that, you know, really, you know, the need now is, uh, I mean, if you can help um, with your time, um, that's great. Uh, but what the need is really right now is financial um you know, when I, you know, that could be your favorite not-for-profit, you know, and when I talked to our team in Hendersonville, you know, their recommendation really was the Red Cross, and then there's a local um, organization, so they had two um, that they felt were doing a pretty good job. Um, so, it, uh, you know, there, that that is the big need. I think the other thing that I wanted to share, too, that, you know, really made me, really made me think is that, uh, especially in today's news cycles, um, a friend of mine, uh, Will Brinker, who lives in uh, Blowing Rock, I saw him last week and he said something that was then backed up by some things that I heard from other people, which is, you know, the, the initial in the news cycle that we live in, this is devastating. And at the same time, it's not going to be news pretty soon. Um, yeah. You know, therefore, a lot of kind of this initial surge of stuff um will go away but he's like this is like months and years <laughs> you know that that people will need help we had another guy from our hendersonville office um yesterday that yeah you know, i'm gonna get this directly wrong but it's like hey there you know while there are hundreds of roads that have been opened up there's still more 
roads closed than were actually opened, <laughs> you know, and bridges, you know, that are, that are still just out, you know, so it's just going to be a, uh, a long, well, you know, when, when I just think about like what it's like to be in a mountain town and you just think about like, what's that cleanup effort going to look like, it, you know, independent of like mm -hmm. the people that can actually competently doing the, do their cleaning and mold remediation, you know, there's only so many of them. Um, so it is, you know, it is going to be really time consuming. So I just, you know, it really got to me in terms of like, Hey, you know, when, when it's a little bit clearer, that would be the time to, you know, go up and offer some physical, um, labor, you know, to help out for me, for me personally, I know a lot of people that are doing it now, but for me personally, that's when I would, uh, plan on going up. So, um, with that in mind, with the money thing, um, you know, we do, we, we will send out, I don't know if you wanted to post in the chat, Gary, or we'll just post on the website, um, and send it out, um, with the, with the YouTube link, uh, with respect to money available, there's really, uh, two sources and they're the same, they're the same kind of buckets. And, you know, when, when, when you hear people talk about grants, <laughs> you know, and then they talk about loans and then they talk about grants for businesses, you know, so a grant, that's, that's the free money, <laughs> you know, meaning like no strings attached, here's the money, right? And there's a lot of confusion right now in the belief that there are grants available for disaster relief for small businesses. Um, the answer to that is, it, you, based on our research, no, there are no grants available for small businesses. What there is available is, when they talk about grants for small businesses, what they're really talking about is the FEMA and local grants that are available for anybody. Yeah. So in other words, like the small business grant, Gary, would really be, hey, dude, Go tell your employees <laughs> to go to go get to go sign up for the for the FEMA um, grant individually. Like it's not at a business level that that occurs, um, and that 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 is the program that you know still has still has funding available, and um, you know they're still doing whatever they're doing with that you know, buddy, um, to, to, to help out people with, uh, Helene and Milton. The second category of things that are available for, so, so in other words, there is no small business grant that we're aware of. If anybody has heard of something, that'd be great. Let us know, but there's no grant available for small businesses. What there is available, um, and this is where there could also be the opportunity for, um, some confusion. What there is available for small businesses is an SBA loan. And then there's a North Carolina equivalent of the SBA loan. So if we remember from the COVID days, since, you know, hopefully not kind of would, you know, not a lot of people in North Carolina for a long time have had to take advantage of an economic injury disaster loan. But in COVID, um, part of the uh, way that uh, small businesses were helped outside of the Paycheck Protection Program and the ERTC is you could also get a loan from the SBA um related to a disaster and covid was de declared a disaster so a lot of our clients got money you know from the government related to EDA loans and it was a topic of a lot of these um webinars that that's not a new program you know that's been around for a long time um so when it is it was put in place for events just like this so the same constructs of the program that were around with the with the with the pandemic and the CARES Act are available right now, which is basically, you know, same restrictions, you know, have to prove that you need it, you know, up to $2 million, you know, same kind of payment terms, same kind of personal guarantee over $200,000, you know, secured by the assets of the business, like all the stuff that was in place for EDA loans before in place now um, for EDL, uh, for Helene and, and Milton. And if you go to the SBA's website, you can actually, um, or the FEMA website includes links to get there. We've also included links to do it in the, um, in the, in the ebook that we put together, but you can apply for the loan now, but where the problem arises, um, that is 
related to, um, you know, kind of here, you know, out of money, um, that, that actually is a true statement. The SBA is out of money right now for this program. So if you, if you apply, but at the same time, they're accepting, accepting applications because they're expecting that Congress will put more money into the program for this specific purpose. And, you know, that, you know, if it's, whether it's politics or not, you know, the Biden administration said, Hey, Congress come back into session, you know, recharge the money. And, and, uh, speaker Johnson said, no, 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 no. Cause we kind of need to know one amount <laughs> and we're not even going to really know an amount. So let's just wait until after the election. So regardless, there's not going to be funding available, um, until after the election, you know, which, you know, kind of make an argument, well, how many of them are going to get approved before the election anyway? I don't know, you know, how fast those loans get posted. But the but the bottom line is, you know, what what people are, what business owners are encouraged to do is to apply now. You will not get money, though, until after the election. And you won't get money unless Congress actually appropriates funds to charge up the program, which is which is completely independent of um the uh FEMA. Like that's not related to FEMA at all. Um it, it's related, it's related to the SBA. So, you know, it it's by you know it's bipartisan support for it. They just, you know, pick a different day to decide when to do it. So I, I'm going to um choose to be positive today, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and believe that uh all parties will do the right thing and uh develop you know enough funding uh for these loans and administer them uh correctly uh which would mean that you know people actually need it because you know i look i gotta tell you i love every one of our clients and at the same time you know i'm maybe they're former clients Gary, or maybe they're just people that I heard of. I know there's some people who got some needle loans that really did not need the money, but they got it because they could get it, you know? So, and that there was nothing wrong with that, you know, because you didn't, because the whole premise was, well, I don't know if I'm going to need it or not, because I don't know how long this pandemic's going to last. Right. Whereas with, I know if I had a disaster or not in the mountains. So if I was otherwise unimpacted, but I'm still applying, it's like, I kind of, would scratch my head on that. Um, related to that, through a related program through the SBA. Um, oh, thanks for that, Gary. Uh, the uh, from a related program through the SBA, you can also get a loan for physical damages, which really would apply in this case for businesses. Um, so you know. You can either get up to $2 million for business damages, or you can get up to $2 million for kind of economic injury, which would really be lost revenues. You can actually apply for both. It's just between the two, they cannot exceed $2 million. So the upper limit is $2 million. Bucks. Um, last thing that I'd hit on is in North Carolina, very similar loan program exists. It's just that it's a hundred grand, you know, not, not $2 million. Um, so that, that's what we, that's what we know, uh, so far, you know, that there are some, some businesses and we talked a little bit about it in the last webinar, you know, it, you know, people are setting up crowdfunding, um, you know, just to, Hey, love this restaurant, help these guys out, you know, which is, which is awesome. You know, at, at the end of the day, it does become taxable income to the recipient. Not a big deal, but hey, <laughs> at the point that I needed money, I'm probably not. But so would my sales have been, you know, if if instead of getting the crowd, like you just have to think about it as like crowdfunding is no different than I sold a hamburger. You know, I just don't have the costs of the hamburger, you know. So and, and arguably, I'm probably going to get less in crowdfunding than I was if I just was open for a couple months. But um, th those are really the options that people have available uh, right now. You're on mute, Gary. Sorry. Uh, one thing that I would say is the crowdfunding option, don't discount that. Um, I have a, a 
a son that has a company that started with the crowdfunding and it's doing quite well. Um, but it needed, you know, they needed some oomph for takeoff and that's what they got. So in, in many cases, a lot of this stuff is, you know, these people are starting all over again. So. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I remember, you know, for myself specifically, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't crowdfund. Um, I didn't do any crowdfunding during the pandemic, but I tipped really, 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 really well. <laughs> in a lot of instances, which is kind of like, you know, same deal, right? Hey, I get takeout, you know, here's like an extra hundred bucks or whatever, you know, so it, uh, I, so I, I do think the same thing could happen for, for places. Cause again, this is dead. Like if I gotta be, like if I gotta be shut down for six months and and I don't have access to something, I mean it, it is catastrophic. Yeah, you know, this is bad, 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 bad. Yeah. You know, like I can't. This isn't quite like the pandemic where it's like, hey, I can still do takeout. You know, like I I can't do takeout because my restaurant is ruined. You know, like we had we had a couple clients and you know Hendersonville, you know didn't didn't get the worst of it. It wasn't great, but we you know we still had clients without power. You know, weeks weeks on. You know, yeah. So cool. If I switch gears or open up. Yeah, for questions. yeah go for it. And, and just so everybody knows in the chat, I've put two links, one that goes back into the Wayback machine four years ago, almost it was uh, December of 2024. And we were talking about uh, PPP and EIDL. And so PPP obviously is not available. EIDL is. And so there's some more information in that link. And then also, if you want to see all the data that Adam is going to be doc, you know, documenting and talking about, um, it is documented in this um, last link where I said our la latest blog on this topic. So uh, check that out for sure. All right. Uh, so when Gary um, says, hey, we're going to try to keep this as apolitical as possible. I think on this particular topic, what it actually means is that I'm going to piss off everybody equally. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, I, you know, if I seriously, because if I if I was to what if if I if I was to, you know, if, if I was to kind of to boil down, you know, what do the two plans represent between Harris, you know, the Harris plan is I'm going to make the rich folk pay for it. And by rich, that's a four hundred thousand dollar business owner and above, <laughs> you know. Uh, the, which, you know, sucks. It's like a lot of big difference in taxes that, that that guy would have to pay 40 grand more a year. You know, it's like, I don't know about you, Gary, but like, I didn't wake up this morning with 40 grand extra lying around to pay no. tax. Like I kind of got used to that rate decrease. Right. You know? And then, uh, then, then the Trump plan is, you know, everybody gets a pony, um, and we'll make China pay for it. <laughs> you know, so, that's, you know, that that's the two plans, you know, and and I think um, what I'll show you is that they're, they're, they're both kind of universally not awesome <laughs> you know, in, some, in some respects, but, you know, they are, they are what they are, uh, you know, and it, it so hopefully uh, something happens uh, different. So what I, what I did want to um, start off by talking about is that, you know, the, the theory you know, the, the theory behind a tax cut, like when, when Gary's given a tax cut, is that, you know, Gary will spend the money and that will uh, cause the government, even at a lower rate, will make it up on volume effectively. You know, Gary will spend the money, <laughs> you know, that'll increase revenues, everybody will be happy. Um and it, what history has shown is that in isolation doesn't typically work unless it's paired by flattening spending or reducing it. <laughs> and that's sort of been, you know, up until, Bill, you know, past Bill Clinton, that was the part like everybody forgot about <laughs> you know, that, that second, that, that second piece, you know, of the puzzle. Uh, so what I wanted to actually start off with um, since both these guys are talking about, you know, spending programs, tax cuts and stuff like that, um, the Congressional Budget Office uh, 
comes up with ideas to reduce spending, which go nowhere, but they do it, <laughs> you know? So what I wanted to do just so people could kind of hear them is like actually see, you know, this is, this is what the nonpartisan, because there's stuff in here that it's like, we'll piss off everybody, <laughs> you know? But what I want to do is just share like, this is what the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says that if we want to be responsible about actually reducing our deficit by cutting spending and raising taxes, this is what would be required to make a real dent <laughs> in the problem. So I couldn't find the same table for their little cuts. So in fairness, Gary, this is, they've got two programs, you know, the little cut program and the big cut program. So in fairness, this is the big cut program. Um, but at the same time, when I look at this, like, I don't know, I mean, sign me up for a lot of this stuff, you know, like, why aren't, you know, you kind of ask yourself, like, why aren't we doing some of this stuff? Um, so if you just look at the savings dollars, you know, kind of the, oh, you can't see anything because I didn't share my screen, did I, Gary? Not yet. This is usually where you would say first time on a Zoom, Adam. And it would be appropriate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm gonna give you you're you're getting ready for a half iron man, man. I'm yeah, trying to there you go. I got easy brain fire. man. Yeah. Okay. So can you see my screen? It should be a website. So yeah. it's projected. Okay. So yeah, we'll if you it. if you kind of if you can see my mouse um here, you know, you kind of from this highlighted row, which is increase maximum taxable earnings that are subject to social security payroll taxes up to the top, that is kind of the health welfare stuff. You know, like when they talk about entitlement reform, this is what they're talking about for the most part with entitlement reform. So the first one is that, you know, we, we've heard it, we've heard a lot of, you know, the first one established caps on federal spending on Medicaid. We've heard a lot of talk about like, you know, states opting into getting receipt, inc getting increased funding um, from the government for state administered um, Medicaid programs, which are really kind of low income, you know, people at risk, you know, type people, right? Well, right now, it kind of doesn't matter what the state spends, you know, you put in a claim, you get it, you know, it's like an unlimited, you know, there's no cap on it, like it's an unlimited fund. So if the state says, hey, I'm going to spend $100, I get $100, if the state spends $500, I get $500, you know, so this, so arguably what this would do is it say, hey, let's stop, let, let's, let's put a cap on the amount that a state can receive from the federal government for Medicare, Medicaid, which I, I, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, but I want to say something like 48 states have kind of opted into it at this point because like, hey, it's free money. Why wouldn't we take it? So the government will put a cap on that, which would mean that the states would then have to say, hey, if we're going to continue to go further than that, it's got to come up out of our dollar or we're going to do something, do something different. Um, the, uh, that that's kind of what the first um, three buckets are. The increased premiums paid for Medicare uh, Part B, you know, this is really the senior prescription drug benefit. You know, they would increase, you know, money on that, um, which is kind of also what this Medicare Advantage benchmarks are. Here, here's the big one, you know, no more HSA or FSA. <laughs> so those would be, post-tax, not pre-tax, and uh, Gary's payment for his family <laughs> coverage would be post-tax, not pre-tax. Pre so that, that's a biggie. Um, reduce Social Security benefits for high-income earners. So, you know, it, like I get the argument that, hey, man, I paid into it. Why wouldn't I get it back at the same time? You know, in the BGW client base, we have clients making, you know, millions of dollars in investment income. They get $38,000 from the from the uh, government. It's like, really? Like, they don't even, like, they're like, oh, I got that? <laughs> you know, like, they don't even remember they got it because it's so little relative to what they actually have. So that, that would just say, hey, man, 
I appreciate that you paid in, but if you make a certain amount, you don't get it um, back. Mm -hmm. uh, taxable earnings on Social Security, that's basically just saying, hey, instead of having a cap on 100 and um, sixty or hundred seventy thousand dollars, whatever it is, let's let's raise that up to help keep it keep it funded. Um, what's what's not in here um, that you've also heard him talk about is just raise the retirement age, so there's less going out. You know, I'm also a big fan of that myself. Um, you know, this non -de non defense discretionary spending. You know, if you click on one of the, each one of these links, there's like a whole description of what it is. But th that's really the big, you know, kind of hey, let's cut the arts program, you know, type type stuff. And then you know, there's also almost, you know, a trillion in here for reducing the defense's annual uh, budget. So then you get into the tax rate. And they've got specific proposals about like, kill this program, kill this program, kill this program. Then you've got the tax rate increases around, um, you know, raising the individual rate, limiting itemized deductions, um, putting in, you know, kind of an increase in the payroll tax to help fund Social Security, and then putting in some sort of national sales tax. <laughs> um, and then this is the this is the carbon tax. So, you know, I mean, going through those, like, I just, I know my opinion of looking at them, um, which is that sucks, but doesn't seem dire <laughs> you know like in other words like i look at these and i sort of feel like yeah that's sort of like me going to julia and saying we need to eat out less right you know like what am i in other words like with with these while collectively they add up to a lot you know for adam boatsman are there any that really feel like oh my god that's draconian <laughs> you know it, it sort of feels like you need to eat out less dude and cook in a little bit more so you got any initial reaction gary <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, um, I'll, I'll give a quick story. So a, a, a good friend who was in our private equity group, he went into college or out of college with three roommates and they started a software company and they did extremely well, extremely well. And then he felt very guilty during the Iraq war and, you know, that continued to go on and on. And this is in like 2004. 2006 something like that and he really wanted to give back because he felt guilty because he had friends that had gone into the war lost their lives etc and he was brilliant um with coding and also kind of supply chain stuff like that and so we were able to we had some people at high places at the time in the government and we were able to get him into a green zone in afghanistan i think so Iraq or Afghanistan, I don't remember. <clears throat> but he went in Joe Patriotic and he came back and he was a miserable mess because he saw all the waste. He was just beside himself for the amount of waste that was happening. And just the left hand either didn't know what the right hand was doing or didn't care. And he, it, it was just really sad to see. And I think whether you like Elon Musk or not, it, wouldn't it be great if we had a big brain that went in and started cleaning house on all this additional duplicitous waste because we've just gotten fat. Uh, so I agree with you, you know, like there, there's got to be some cleaning of the house, but the problem is, is we've, you know, just got it gotten fat and, and happy yeah. and we've had people that have taken jobs and gotten fat and happy by doing these things that are just pushing paper and really not making impact. And the private sector, we would never get away with that. Yeah. Which no, is why I, we uh, love working with, with the private sector. But Gary, I like my Starbucks coffee. How dare you take away my Starbucks coffee in the morning? I don't know what I'll do without my Frappuccino in the morning for $7. Anyway. <laughs> brew, brew some green tea, man. That's yeah, I know. Awesome. No, I know. I know. I know. I know. I uh, know. So anyway, Moving on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, in terms of the uh, policy proposals, you know, this is this is what we sent out in the. Um, in our uh, blog that Gary put down, this is this is just a nonpartisan evaluation, you know, 
uh, and they kind of tell you what the low central high, you know, actually means. But this is a nonpartisan um, evaluation of what would happen um, in either candidate's uh, proposal. So under Harris, you know, and, and again, you know, you may get like, well, why is Trump so much bigger to the deficit? That can't surely be true if you're a Trump supporter. I mean, it's, you know, like, it, I'm not opining one way or the other. It's just like, well, because Harris is saying she's going to raise taxes. So of course, <laughs> that's, <laughs> you know, and Trump isn't. <laughs> you know, so like it, you know, of course, that's what's going to happen. So, um, so if you look at the top, you know, the top and the red are all the tax cuts. And what, you know, what this 20, what this 2050 represents, it says extend the tax cuts and jobs hat for households making less than $400,000. Both um, Trump and Harris propose keeping the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in place, with the exception that Harris wants to put a ceiling on it at 400 grand. Um, whereas with Trump, it would be as it is today, which is there is no ceiling. So in other words, under the Harris point, like BGW, like there are specialized businesses like BGW that do already have this $400,000 threshold. So what she's basically saying is like, everybody out there is going to have to be like BGW, you know, versus saying, Hey, attorneys, you know, CPAs, architects had a great lobby. They should be in there, but they're not, they're excluded. Um, and it's ridiculous. What's up with our lobby? Nah, it sucks. Yeah, exactly. We're you too know. cheap. <laughs> yeah, we're too, we're too cheap. We didn't spend enough money, you know, taking people out to dinner in Las Vegas or whatever. So, you know, th these are basically the gives, um, for Harris, you know, which are really, um, you know, kind of, you know, the, the, the big, the biggies are extending the tax cuts and jobs act and then expanding the child tax credit. So that, those, are, those are kind of her two. I mean, if you look at that, that's, that's 3.4 trillion of the 5.1 trillion projected. So it's, it's by far the biggest number is child tax credit. So basically giving money to low income people and extending the tax cuts and jobs act. She's just mm -hmm. extending it less than Trump. So her revenue raisers to offset it, this is where the tax in so this first one here, this making this is actually a tax increase from today. Even though it's called a tax cut, it's actually a tax in increase from what we're um enjoying today. So, you know, like, hey, they put together a presentation. I think it's a little disingenuous because it makes me believe that I'm getting a tax cut when really it's like, no, I'm actually just avoiding, <laughs> you know, the 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 law change that would trigger a, an automatic tax increase. So then she, the increase in the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28%, this is for C corporations only. So this wouldn't apply to most of our classes or most of our, most of our, um, most of our clients, this increases in capital income. This is uh, putting in an increased rate on capital gains above, I want to say it's $2 million. So would hit a couple of our clients like upon a business sale, but you know, for a lot, it would not. Um, this is an increasing, um, kind of increasing the equivalent of social security taxes. Uh, reform international uh tax rules and th this is basically saying hey getting a little bit more of that repatriation tax running so like one of the one of the good things that trump did is uh and it, you have this happen periodically in administrations they said hey man you know if y'all if apple if you'll bring your money back to the u.s I'll tax it at a lower rate. So there's like this one-time influx in 2018 from people bringing cash back on shore. Um, and then on a going forward basis, Apple is still taxed on cash that it leaves in like Ireland. It's just at a reduced rate. Um, so Kamala would, or Harris would, um, I get yelled at by calling her first name. Um, she would uh, increase that tax a little bit. Um, from where it is today. Um, reduce pre prescription drug costs. This would be jamming more down some price controls on prescription drug costs. Um, 
And then this 1.15 trillion is just more kind of more enforcement or more hammer. So what she's trying to do here with hers is to is to say, hey, let's be let's be revenue, let's be neutral. You know, given some tax cuts, here are my revenue raisers to offset it. You know, I'm landing it square. You know, and then depending on like which scenario you pick, you know, it either is adding to the deficit or not in terms of this low central high, which is really just based on like, hey, what what are different economic broader GDP scenarios to apply this against? Um, from the Trump perspective, uh, you know, his his big one in terms of the give back is the same as Harris's, it's just with no limits. You know, so this is basically the same as Harris. It's just there's no four hundred thousand dollar limit. Um, so that's four point six trillion. Uh, his over exempt overtime from taxes proposal. That's what this one is. Um, you know, kind of the opposite of uh these guys, which is, hey, let's um you know get rid of those social security benefits from people that make money. Trump says, let's just not tax them <laughs> uh, right here. Um, he's implementing a new thing which is lowering the corporate tax rate for domestic manufacturers. This actually used to be a thing called um, DPAD, the Domestic Producers um, Adjustment Deduction, uh, which was great, you know, and then the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act actually got rid of it, replaced it with the Qualified Business Income Deduction. So what Trump is bringing is saying, hey, let's, let's actually bring that back in addition to um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, to, to, in theory, you know, spur domestic manufacturing. Um, exit tick, tax income, ta uh, tip income. I haven't looked at what the strength and modernize the military is. Um, and then he similarly would do some first-time homebuyer credit stuff. Um, and then when you look at, well, how would Trump pay for it? how Trump would pay for his. So if you look at this, you know, if it face value, you know, it's, it's not too bad. I mean, we got zero versus 1.4 trillion, you know, that's not, that's not horrible. Um, given the projection range of 10 years. Um, but with the tariffs, the challenge is going to be in this very first one, establish a universal baseline tariff and, and additional tariffs um, as the revenue raiser. So, the problem with this one is so this this is like his 10% across the board or 20% depending on like which version you know he, he goes with if if it if it hits the US shores it's getting taxed and i don't care what it is um because, because right now what we have are tariffs that are targeted towards like a country or an industry um this would just be across the board anything foreign you know that hits our shores it's going to have a tariff um, the, the challenge to that is really going to be twofold. Um, one is while the president enjoys a high degree of latitude in terms of imposing tariffs, they're supposed to be situational. Um, and if you just, Hey, universal, like, it's like, well, what's the situation, you know, like with, with, um, with, uh, steel and aluminum, you know, that which Biden kept a lot of this. What it's it's sort of like what happened with this is that tariffs were like a hand a little bit off limits for like every president. And Trump says, I'm doing it. <laughs> um and then once Trump did it, Biden was like, oh you got away with that? Well hell yeah I'm gonna keep that in place myself. <laughs> you know, um and it has it has you know raised some government money because it is a government receipt. Um but it, they were still targeted. It's like the steel and aluminum tariffs were, hey, we're trying to protect vital critical infrastructure was sort of like the case. You know, like, hey, steel is vital to defense. We got to protect it. Therefore, everybody's getting tariffs imposed on steel, you know, as an example. If it's universal, what some people say is like, well, what's your case for that? You know, um, like, how are you going to get away with that legally? So there are some, you know, the, the wonky people in the room would say, I don't know if that really falls under the authority. He might have to get Congress to approve of that. And people in Congress would say, it doesn't matter which party, you know, you're in. People in Congress say, heck yes, you want to, uh, you have to get our approval for that. You went too far. 
And at the same time, in the history of the United States, do you know how many times that Congress has actually overridden the president on a tariff that the president wanted to impose, Gary? Uh, probably zero. Zero! <laughs> so, you know, who freaking knows on this one? I mean, they, I, I pulled up an article uh, before um, preparing for this to talk about the tariffs uh, from the Cato Institute, which, you know, is one of my favorites, Gary, the libertarian. <laughs> yeah. And they're basically they, said, too, too bad they couldn't you yeah. know, field a good candidate this year. But nah, I know, yeah. She's she's running again. Yeah, we need to start winning some local elections first and getting some momentum <laughs> behind us. But the uh it's funny, like you know who one of you know who one of my favorite guys to watch was? I loved watching him every time, like I was addicted to him. John Stossel. You remember him? Oh yeah. Yeah, I love John he's, mustache. Yeah, he's one of my favorite, like he I, you know, he's like the one of the poster childs for libertarians. Um, and like I just I miss seeing him. <laughs> Oh, yeah. so much. <laughs> well, I, I didn't John Stossel die. I thought like he may he may be, he may be dead, but he was on he was on sixty minutes, yeah. and then he went to Fox News. Um, so yeah. after he left after he left sixty minutes, uh, yeah, I I miss me some John Stossel. You know, he he could always give me he could always no, give he's me still little, alive. Oh, he is he's okay. Still alive. He, he'd always give me a little bit of the outcry. So I just would love to know what is he doing today. You know. Um, another another one that you don't hear from anymore that even though he's a Republican, he probably leans libertarian is Grover Norquist. Yeah, mm. you don't you don't hear anything out of that guy anymore. So it's like what you don't. so yeah, what would Grover do? You know? Um, but these are guys like these are, you know, when I get accused of being a liberal, Gary, I'm like, I remind, I love John Sassel, I love Grover Norquist. <laughs> so um so the uh well, supposedly uh uh Coke Charles Coke was a libertarian, but I don't know. I he is like he is like he founded the Cato Institute, so I I, I believe that. Um, so the uh, so the the additional challenge with the tariff is that you you cannot dispute that um, they raise money for the government, but where it gets really fuzzy is well then kind of then what happens you know so if i if i gave like a real world example of what would happen under this plan gary is that um you know one of our one of our clients that i'm meeting with this afternoon uh is a domestic manufacturer so check yay i have a lower tax rate so right out of the gate they're like that's sweet i got a six percent lower tax rate however they're owned by 